Hi, I'm Mike with UTASIC here again at SCNA. I'm sitting down with Eddie uh, Oshinea, and uh, we're it's a little bit late at night, so I apologize for the uh, for the dark light. We're we don't have the best lighting, but we wanted to move forward with the interview because I think what Eddie has to say is interesting enough to to want to warrant a, a good listen. You, now, you you co-authored the Apprenticeship Patterns book with uh, Dave Hoover. And it's been a very well-received book in the software craftsmanship. It's, it's been a, a, a very uh, useful tool that people who want to become software developers can look at. Um, but I'm curious as to how you see apprenticeships and the concept of a user community. Um, is, is there some kind of way that people who are interested in apprenticeships can use the user community to learn more? Or is there value for user communities to reach out and talk to apprentices. Okay, so when we tried to define what apprenticeship meant, we were trying to get at this idea that you can't just learn on your own. Mm -hmm. So one of the examples that was really instrumental in getting me to understand this was that I spent a year trying to learn to juggle. Oh. And I bumped into somebody for 20 minutes in Belgium and I made more progress in those 20 minutes with that person mm -hmm. than I had in the entire year of trying to learn from a book. Right. And that made me realize that it's so much easier to learn from other people. And it's better if it's not just one person, mm -hmm. which is the traditional model of an apprenticeship. It's better if there's a community of people because they can teach you different things. Mm -hmm. You still want the one-to-one -one relationship with a mentor, but you still can benefit from a community. In fact, one of the patterns in the book is called Kindred Spirits. Okay. And it came out of Dave's experiences with a lot of user groups where he was learning new skills. And so for us, as an, as an apprentice, you need a community. You ideally need to be a member of multiple communities so you can pick up a variety of different skills. But also for community, apprentices, people with that kind of mindset can bring an energy to your community. Right. They can bring new ideas, especially if they're members of and other enthusiasm. communities. Enthusiasm. Exactly. But also, they have, you get somebody who comes in and who wants to learn, who wants to do everything you consider boring, everything right. you've considered, oh yes, everybody knows about that. Right. Having somebody new in your community means there's somebody who wants to come in and if your community is bored with TDD, there's somebody who finds it new and interesting and they want to know the details. And they will come in with a different perspective. And they may end up reinventing it from underneath you. And this is one of the most powerful ideas that you can bring new people into a community, teach them the things the community does, does well, and then listen to their ideas so that when they revolutionize or even just improve your community, you can actually incorporate that. Right, and, that, and that's kind of interesting. I mean, I, I think of a uh, uh, person I interviewed earlier, Colin, uh, Colin Jones. He was an apprentice at Eighth Light, and he just embraced, or, or the closure community, he embraced the closure community, and it in turn embraced him back. And now he's contributing very much to other people's learning. So he went from being an apprentice, seeing something cool, going to that community saying, I'm willing to learn, let me help and let me learn. And they said, okay, sure, here you go. And, it, and then next thing you know, he's, he's pretty much an expert at closure and people with far senior in the industry are coming to him for help. That's, I, I think it's very interesting. I think it's a very it's powerful the, idea. I mean, one of the things that, one of the patterns we talk about in the book is this notion of share what you learn. It actually came out of an initial pattern called record what you learn, which is this idea that you shouldn't just go off and learn, you should write down the things you've learned, why you learned them, how you learned them. Because in the future, you'll look back on those and you'll get new insights. And then one of the things that we realized was that actually, just because you've written down this experience, the things you've learned, doesn't mean you always want to publish it. Right. But there's a very narrow set of things, of circumstances where you want to share this with a wider community of people because you believe that community will benefit. But you do that after you've got to a stage of comfort. One of the things the community can provide you with is a place you can go to try stuff out. Right. To say, I have this idea and show it to people. And they may explain to you why it's broken, but because it's your community, it's, or it's a community that welcomes you, they can guide you away from your errors. So it's a little bit of a safe place exactly. to share. That's one of the great things about having a community, especially outside work. Mm -hmm. You can say, I took this thing we're building and I rewrote it in IO or IOKI or yeah. J or you know, on Lambda and here it is and it's a huge giant mess. <laughs> and I learned a lot of things from making this huge giant mess. Right. And that's okay. 
Because it's a community that cares about learning. Yeah, but if you do that at your job, you, you're be putting yourself at risk. There's, there's a potential for financial loss. There's a potential for financial loss. Or status loss. loss. But it's also the sense that you are taking risks with the data your company is giving you, taking risks with the trust other members of your team have placed in you. Mm -hmm. But knowing that you have this safe place you can go to to try stuff out is actually really valuable. In fact, one of the patterns in the book is called Breakable Toys. It's right. based on a quote from Linus Torvalds. David's favorite. Yes. And the beauty of it is this idea that I can go off and do things, and it's okay if they don't work. Right. Because the goal is to learn, not to build something that works. Mm -hmm. So one of mine is a very, very slow project I've been working on, which is to write a puzzle for a language, for a magazine that is no longer exists. <laughs> the magazine went bust before they launched their first edition, or they shut down. And there was a contest they ran to build a parser so people could write articles for the magazine. But the magazine's gone. The mm. test cases for the parser are still there. And I've been using that as a breakable toy. So I'm writing in Java. I'm handwriting the parser and the Lexa and everything. Mm -hmm. But I'm writing in Java and I'm not using any of the Java tools. Oh, so, so you're trying to build it all from, relatively fast. speaking, standard lib up. Worse than that, I'm not using any IDE. I'm using you know, just TextMate. That's my text editor, no fancy extensions. Mm. I'm not using any fancy build tools. I'm not even using Java doc. I'm using Java P if I want to read the method signatures of things, oh, wow. which so is insanely difficult. Yes. But it's forcing me to actually think about what I actually really know about Java mm -hmm. and what I've just sort of offloaded to the tools and making me aware of the distinction between I know how that works and oh, I'll just read that in a Java doc. Right. And that distinction is quite powerful. The other thing it does is that it forces you to really think about how you design a parser. By the way, I'm doing all of this test first, right. which makes it even harder. Right. I've so got to the stage where the parsing books are saying, at this point, you switch to Adler. And I'm continuing on. And it's something I pretty much only work on in airports as well, yeah. because I'm something I do completely offline. Mm -hmm. So it's a very slow project, but it's very educational. So the idea is, is not, and this is kind of uh, almost sounds like uh, uh, a code or tree exercise writ very large, yeah. um, where it's, you're like, I'm going to do this the hardest way possible. <laughs> Basically. <laughs> yeah, and, but, you know, the goal, there's no deliverable, there's just the exercise. It's like tending a garden, it yes. sounds like. It's like, well, maybe not tending, well, well, tending a bonsai. I know for certain nobody's going to use this thing. Right. I know I'm not going to use this. I don't actually even like the syntax of the language that much. But I find the exercise is challenging because this was somebody who designed the grammar of a language for a set of problems, mm -hmm. which are very large. There are no compromises to make it easier. It's just, this is what we'd like the language to do. And there's a community of people who built working versions of these, of this parser in a variety of languages. So I know it's possible. I can see ahead of me in the road all the people who built working implementation of the sensible way and it took them a few days. Right. And I've been working on it for about a year and a half the hardest way possible. You can sit on GitHub and I don't make much progress because maybe six months will go by and I'll actually look at it and I'll get one test to pass. Right. And I'll write down what I learned. And it's up there publicly if anybody wants to look at it. I'm not sure how much value they'll get from it, but I get a lot of value. Just forcing myself to be very explicit, very deliberate, very careful in building something. That's very interesting. Like I was saying, I think that's almost like Trimming the bonsai. It's just, yes. I just want to. There's, there's no. There's just a zen of working yeah. on this thing. That it, that there's no deliverable. There's no end to it. There's just the journey. Yes. So that's very interesting. Well, thank you very much for taking the time to sit thank down. Thank you very much.